I want to thank Brian and Ed for allowing me to talk to you today. I know they said new surgeons, but they didn't specify how old we had to be to talk today. So I want to thank Sages for letting me talk today on uh, closing the direct hernia defect. Um, I do have a disclosure. I volunteer at Everglades National Park doing mobile bike patrol one day a week. And every picture that you see, and there will be plenty, I, I did take, and they're real. Anyway, when you look at the history of herniography, I could do the whole talk in this one slide, and we're really done. Goes back for 150 years, looking at Marcy, Bassini, McVeigh, Cooper, Schuldice. You're talking about closing the floor to the inguinal canal. Talk is really over. Um, but then when you get into 1988, when laparoscopic revolution started, you even have Dr. Gurr in his um, article uh, in 1990 about closing the internal ring with a clip. I do want to mention Dr. Kakuda's article, not to say he was the only one doing uh, fibrin sealant. It was also widely out in the uh, European literature. But in the American literature, in the annals of surgery, it, it's a great way to think about getting rid of dead space, lessening your serohematomas, and lessening that patient's anxiety about the sense that they have a recurrent hernia when they come back to your office three days later or they call you the next day that I have a recurrent hernia, what did you really do? So the real question is, should we keep doing what we've been doing for the past 150 years? And yeah, that, that really is a boa that you read about in the paper eating alligators and, and deer. Um, so the first question I ask myself is, well, what are the guidelines? Are there guidelines out there on what we should be doing? And um, there, there are. I, I think you need to, f to first look at what SAGES has. They don't have inguinal hernia guidelines, but I think you can glean from their ventral hernia guidelines published in 2016 that closure of the defect should be undertaken at your discretion. And there are theoretical advantages that exist, but have not been proven. And it is weak evidence, and you'll see why in a minute. But I think we can take that information and apply it to inguinal hernias, because there's a lot of similarities between what we do with the ventrals and what we do in an inguinal. But if you look at the European Hernia Society, they came out with guidelines back in 2009. And just to paraphrase uh, that article, which appeared in Hernia, is that the repair and or reinforcing of the fascial defect in the posterior of the wall is recommended, and you should avoid tension in that repair. The fortunate thing about coming to SAGES is they do video these talks. So I did go back and look at this talk, which was given last year by Dr. Kutzi. The, the, the slide of that alligator eating a um, turtle is not main, meant any way to derogatory to Dr. Kutzi, but <laughs> <clears throat> but the turtle does get away. The, the alligator can't hold on to it, so it's like any complication we have in surgery. You may think it's really bad, and there is blood, but if you're patient, uh, the alligator does tire and lets the turtle go, go away. Um, he did report on closing the direct floor back then, and what his um, final opinion in his talk, and summarize it in, in this slide, is that it, it probably reduces hernia and pain, and it might reduce the hernia uh, recurrence rate. So then if you go to the literature, and we'll go through some of these articles, there's, there's a plethora of very small series, and it's hard to base any, any definite facts on, on conclusions on that. But if you go back just to non-prosthetic direct hernia repair during radical prostatectomy in the Journal of Uro, 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 uh, Urology, and Urology in 2016, it's safe. I mean, not a large series of patients. They did have uh, almost two and a half years follow-up. No recurrence, no complications. So, you can suture the floor of the inguinal canal um, in, a, in a laparoscopic robotic prostatectomy. You know, if you go back to my early series, yes, I was endolooping, and, and there are um, articles out there for the TEP repairs about closing that posterior floor. Um, this is a hernia article in 2012, and it appears safe. Not big series, but 79 patients, um, one seroma. Um, maybe you want to use the barbed wire, one of those newfangled barbed wires, and close the, fl the floor. There's literature out there, very small series, saying, yeah, take a barb suture and suture across it and give yourself some reinforcement. It's a reproducible technique. Can't make any conclusions, but again, only one seroma that was documented in that article. 
Coming more recently, and then what I do more commonly is robotic repairs. So this is a, lar a larger series, but it's a lot of surgeons contributing just a few patients. Um, all these were obese patients. They did compare open techniques, and they did conclude that obese patients having a robotic tap had a lower complication rate than doing it open. And I think most of us think that or know that anyway. What I do want to share, and many of you probably don't know about this article, it was just published in December of um, this past year in the, in the American Surgeons, is I reported on my first 154 cases with a minimum of two-year follow-up. Um, age average 57, wasn't, didn't take long to do these cases. BMI was as high as 31. A lot of umbilical hernias out there, so it documented that. So there were 31, a third of the patients were direct hernias, so yes, they were all closed. Um, did have one recurrence rate. I'll show you a picture of what that looked like. I did have to convert one patient to open because the, I could not get his colon out of his scrotal sac and am never afraid to go open. And yes, one patient got terribly constipated and presented uh, a week post-op with perforated diverticulitis. So looking at 184 cases with two-year follow-up, it's safe, it's effective, it's something to consider. So. I've done about, I've done 315 robotic uh, hernias to date. I have a pretty large experience over 27 years doing laparoscopic repair. I started closing defects pretty early on when I realized there were seromas, there were dead space. I wanted to lessen that incidence of seromas and try to prevent that serohematoma, which the patient again feels is a recurrence. So first, you know, you can start with a protac. It's a very simple way to pull that hernia sac back and tack it to the pubis. You can end loop it, very simple. Um, now I'm using a zero ethabon suture to close as tension-free as possible, just to give myself a floor, something to rest that mesh against. And then I put a fairly large size piece of mesh, um, and then I secure it with some fiber and sealant, also to following Dr. Kakuta's um, paper, to try to lessen those seromas, get better control of the bleeding. So yeah. I, I'll tell you right now, with my experience, it's pretty darn good results. Just to show you a picture, you don't have to watch me uh, suture, but you can see on, on the left side a fairly good sized direct hernia, and you can take an ethabon suture and get some nice reinforcement without tension um, to close that hole. So that's a before and after. And then cover it with a large piece of mesh and um, fix it with Evacel. So what I just wanted to mention is this, is this is a patient who had a direct hernia, presents quite a few years later with an indirect, because as I want you all to remember and think about, mesh shrinks. And even though I know that mesh was all the way to the end of the screen on the left and down onto the psoas, you can see where it has retracted or flipped up underneath into a new hernia in the internal ring. So it's something to think about, and many times I will partially close that internal ring just to try to get myself some reinforcement, give that mesh something to hold on to instead of free space. And this is just a, a bad picture of, of that same repair um, done robotically. So the question I want to leave today and what I was asked to is, should you close the direct hernia? And if you listen to my talk, the answer may be pretty obvious and I want to answer it with a rhetorical question, do bears shit in the woods? Well, working in the Everglades, this is quite obvious that bears don't shit in the woods. If you only look at this picture, they, um, they leave their scat on the research road to the uh, Nike missile site in the Everglades, so you decide. Thank you.